Hi, Misha here, and this isn't a video I plan to make, or frankly, want to make, but after sleeping on it, I thought it would be worth making it, and hopefully helpful. No matter which side of the issue you're on, there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding about a lot of things but especially about the so-called assault weapons ban in recent days weeks there's been a renewed push as there has been in the past to go back to the 1994 assault weapons ban part of the crime bill which sunset in 2004 there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it did do and what it did not do. In fact, I think there are still a large group of people that believe an assault weapon equals select fire or fully automatic. So I want to talk about the different aspects, how it treated rifles, handguns, shotguns, and how the landscape changed under it and even talk about was it effective or not and kind of where we're at i'm approaching this video as i would back when i was a teacher my own personal feelings and conclusions and ideas i'm going to keep out of it absolutely as much as possible i may do end up doing a black box on my personal private channel going more into detail, but for this video, I just want to clarify what the assault weapons ban was. And I've started off with guns that I grew up with and want to talk about firearms, ownership, and shooting, and what have you in the 1980s and early 1990s, at least from my perspective growing up in uh, the Ozark Mountains, Arkansas. Back in the day, surplus military bolt actions were quite common. Many of them were cut down and so-called sporterized for hunting. I just happened to grab my 1903 A3, 30-06, 5-shot bolt gun, adopter, rear sights, peeper sights, semi-pistol grip stock, a classic veteran of World War II. These were everywhere. Firing 30-06, they had very good range and are very dependable and accurate. This is one I picked up around 2003. Moving down, though, is actually one of the first guns I ever fired and one of the guns I inherited from my father when he passed last year. This is, of course, a Stevens single-shot break-open 410. One day I'll do a video on it, but I haven't emotionally been ready yet. But these are everywhere too. Shotguns of different types and calibers. A lot of pumps, a lot of 870s, but a lot of single shots too. And I shot this thing for the first time when I was, I don't know, four or five. And it was useful for squirrel and other small game, quail. And... He actually got it from his grandfather, so it's been in the family since uh, the 1940s. Very much a traditional American sporting frontier type gun. Moving down, probably one of the first semi-autos I ever fired, I think I was age six, was an M1 Grand. Much like the O3, it's in 30-06, but this one fires one round every time you pull the trigger and it has an eight round internal magazine and this one is actually truly clip fed semi pistol grip stock you know the grand but the main thing is to point out this is semi auto the same operation as any civilian legal AK or AR in America, as well as other guns. But moving down would be the first 
AR, and really the only AR we had in America for a long time, the Colt SB-1, introduced in 1964 for 20 some odd years. These were it, and these were the first 223 guns. These were often used for target shooting, frankly, sometimes as a varmint rifle, but mostly just target shooting and fun. People enjoyed their lightweight. It was kind of a novelty. And this was the first gun of its type, say with a pistol grip and flash suppressor, bayonet lug that I ever saw. And while this isn't the one I grew up with, I did grow up with one. And it was actually really good for a child to shoot because lightweight, low recoil. After all, it's a 22, but much bigger. <laughs> And this was really about it. I mean, you had some AK imports and things, but around these parts, an SP-1 was exotic enough. And of course, that carried over to handguns, too. This is an original and another one I inherited. This is a high standard that my mother gave my father for one of their wedding anniversaries back in the 60s. 22 revolver. It's kind of made in the classic cowboy style, even though, you know, it was made in the 1960s. I probably shot a 22, this one, this literal one gun, along with a, a Ruger standard 22, which was an automatic versus a revolver, as young as age three, with, again, great supervision, of course. But 22 handguns, not a bad place to start. And around that time, in that era, there were lots of 38, and to a lesser extent, 357 revolvers out there. They were very much the standard for police and a lot of civilians. This is my Model 15 Smith & Wesson. But there were some self-loading automatic handguns available. A friend, well his dad, had a Luger, not this one. This is 9 mil. His was in 30. But, yeah, Lugers were around. And I remember how they felt really good in the hand. He also had a broom handle Mauser. I thought it was cool, but the Luger stuck in a lot of our minds. And these were everywhere. But even then, they were prized. And, of course, there were plenty of surplus 1911s and new production Colts. Series 70, Series 80, and later on the series, uh, well, the 1991 A1s. And then finally, I remember very clearly in the late 80s when my brother, who was a police officer, traded in, well, first he had a Smith & Wesson revolver. I believe it was a 66. It might have been a 686. Traded in first for a Beretta 92. And then when he switched from county to city they issued Glock Gen 1's and that was a novelty a plastic a polymer framed gun plus a very high capacity for the 1980's 17 shots and of course back then there were lots of rumors about you could sneak these through airports through metal detectors it proved to obviously not be true but it was new and people didn't know what it was so yeah when I was a child in the, in the 80's it would be, you know, the Glock and the SP-1 were the kind of the most, as we would call them today, tactical guns available. Otherwise, it was a bunch of uh, brown guns, a lot of bolts, some M1 Grands, quite a few M1 Carbines, which I also liked shooting as a kid. And we had a number of handguns, although a lot of 22s and, th and 38s floating around back then. So that kind of sets the stage for you. Um, while we had imports like the Chinese AK and of course the Austrian Steyr AUG, the Daewoo, they just, they weren't in Arkansas. That was uh, for other areas, probably with more money, frankly. A very brief rundown of what came before. It's true that there was not a lot of firearms restrictions on the federal level before the 1930s. There were some on local levels. Interestingly, post-Civil War, firearms rules were set about to try to keep guns out of the hands of recently freed slaves, and also Native Americans. Hmm. 
Anyway, in 1934, we had the first big one, the National Firearms Act, the NFA. This was in response to gang, back, gang activities in places like Chicago and the police being outgunned. This did not outlaw fully automatic weapons, but it made them prohibitively expensive and they were put on a registry. You had to pay $200 stamp tax plus the cost of the gun and it was a fully registered thing. You had to go through a lot of paperwork. 200 bucks was a lot of money during the Great Depression. Just a few years later, 1938, the first efforts of setting up what we know today as the FFL system, the firearms dealer system, and also the initial efforts to prohibit criminals, people convicted of crimes, of owning firearms. During World War II, not much happened. During the 50s, eh. We move to the 1960s, and of course we have several tragic events like the Kennedy assassination, Martin Luther King assassination, another Kennedy assassination, and so on. So in 1968, another round of gun legislation was passed. For one, the age to purchase a handgun was upped from 18 to 21 years. And for another, the FFL system was really strengthened. Interstate commerce of firearms was restricted. For example, you couldn't mail order guns. And handguns were not allowed to be sold in between states. For example, if I live in Oklahoma, I can't come over to Arkansas or go down to Texas and buy a handgun. It has to be within the state. Things of that nature. This was quickly followed up by the Gun Control Act, which really dealt with importation and to try to prevent Saturday night specials. So it set up a point system for handguns, and if they didn't meet it, they weren't allowed in. It also actually put a lot of restrictions on the importation of military surplus bolt actions. Because one had been used to kill Kennedy, they were seen as quite a threat. And this would keep on throughout the 70s. And in 1981, of course, there, there would be the attempted assassination of Reagan in which uh, Brady himself was hit, leading to further events. In 1986, you had the FOPA and you had... At this time, you see revisions to previous rules. The 1968 Gun Control Act was revised and in some ways made more fair and, and more honest. It actually did allow surplus guns to come in. On the other hand, the uh, machine gun registry part of the NFA was closed in May of 1986, meaning no new select fire, fully, fully automatic rifles or pistols, or for that matter, shotguns, would be allowed. The ones on the list were grandfathered in, but no new serials could be added to the list, therefore no new stamps could be added, effectively banning select fire automatic guns. I think that is worth pointing out for clarity. And finally, in 1989, George H. Bush signed an executive order that it banned the importation of assault rifles or assault weapons, saying that they were not sporting. And I've covered that in other videos, but it set up kind of a criteria, thinking things like pistol grips, bayonet lugs, and uh, threaded barrels. Those are those are those are no go. It didn't really address magazine capacity, interestingly. And now let's turn to what became the assault weapons ban, how it came to be. Much as today, back then. It was authored by Diane Feinstein of California. California suffered a couple of tragic shootings. In 1989, there was the Stockton school shooting. Uh, one teacher was killed and 34 students were shot, five of which uh, passed away. And to be honest, it was done with a Chinese AK. Some auto, of course. This was followed up in 1993 by the uh, 101 Street shooting, which injured six and killed eight. Their Tech Nines were used, at least a couple of the guns used were Tech Nines. And this would lead to Feinstein spearheading, along with other people in California, their assault weapons ban. And this is when the term assault weapon comes around. Many in the gun community point out that it is a made-up term. True, 
so was assault rifle when Sturmgewehr was coined. In the beginning, really all new terms are made up, so machine gun comes to mind when the Thompson came around, you know what I mean? Today, even though it was made up in the 90s by politicians, we do have definitions, and we're about to talk about what defines it under the federal assault weapons ban. Either way, once it passed in California, it was brought to the federal level and put into the House, and it passed. Then it went before the Senate and passed 52 to 48. It was signed by President Bill Clinton the same day it passed the Senate, September 13, 1994. It's worth pointing out that it did have bipartisan support, including from former presidents Ford, Reagan, Carter, and Bush, not to mention Clinton himself, and several other Republicans in the Senate and the House at the time. So, it passed. Now, one caveat in it was the Sunset Clause, something pretty unprecedented, if I'm being honest with you. But it's what they needed to do. And it was part of a greater bill, the crime bill. Actually, a very small part of it. The crime bill actually devoted a lot of money to try to prevent violence against women, prevent sex crimes, track sex criminals. It um, devoted more money to hire new police officers, train them, open new prisons. That was kind of the, the one end of the stick. And so, like anything else, both sides got some things they want and had to put up other things they did not. That's politics. So, the assault weapons ban, a minor part of the crime bill, prohibited assault weapons. It is worth distinguishing that they weren't assault rifles because it dealt with handguns and shotguns besides. How did it define them? And was it effective, or was it simply cosmetic? I'm just going to tell you the facts and hope you can make your own conclusions. With that, let's get into the nitty-gritty. The Federal Assault Weapons Ban was multi-faceted, but there were some generalizations. It applied to semi-automatics, never bolt actions, manually operated, and it applied to modern production, non-antique firearms. And it also really focused, although not exclusively, on detaching magazine guns. There were certain guns that were prohibited by name or manufacturer specifically. And then the other weapons were defined by characteristics, features, if you will. And the three broad categories were rifle, handgun, shotgun. And the main focus was rifle, specifically centerfire. So I picked these to kind of illustrate things. There were five characteristics, five features that were outlined that were intended to define an assault weapon rifle. Number one, folding and or collapsing stock. So that's why I brought out the Chinese here. So no more stocks that do this or AR style collapsing. Number two, pistol grip. is seen on this Beretta AR-70 and also the Chinese. Number three, bayonet lug. Here on the Chinese, it's under the front sight. On the Beretta, it's under the gas block. Number four, a flash hider, which the Breda does have. The Chinese does not. This is a muzzle brake. However, 
further part of that is, or a threaded barrel able to accept a flash hider. So while the Chinese does not have it on here, the 14 by one left hand thread does have flash hiders made for it. Interestingly, there is a small loophole in the Romanian SAR2 PA86 because it had a unique 22 millimeter thread that there was never a flash hider on record made for it. So technically, you could have had 22 millimeter threads because they only accepted a muzzle brake or a blank fire device for that matter. And number five is the reason I brought out the Beretta grenade launcher. Yeah. Now, the flip up grenade sights are not actually the grenade launcher. Even the gas cutoff here isn't what defines this as a grenade launcher. This ring on the barrel with the spring clip, that's the grenade launcher for standard NATO grenades. Never mind that those were not allowed for import anyway since 1968. Those were the five features. Now, they would only apply to semi-automatic guns that took a detaching magazine that potentially could be over 10 rounds. That's why guns like this infield, this is an Ishapur 2A1, were not involved. It does have a bayonet plug, and it actually has a 12 round magazine. But since it was a bolt action, not to mention the CNR, need not apply. I was actually gonna grab my Spanish FR8, but I found this first, so there you go. And the deal was to define something as an assault weapon rifle, it had to have two or more of the features from the list. One feature was a okay, two was not. So let's kind of look at the results. Now, again, to be clear, 1994 did not affect imports that was 1989 and that's really a topic for another video in fact the domestic assault weapons ban was less strict because it allowed at least one evil feature plus detaching magazine compared with the import of 89 ban because it allowed none if it had the detaching mag I actually did find one gun of mine that is in the same configuration as it was sold in the ban era, my trusty SLR 100H, and I never bothered to convert it. The one feature the manufacturers went with was the pistol grip. That was the choice most made. And guns at the time were shipped with so-called low capacity, usually five or 10 round mags, and they would simply delete the bayonet lug. You see here it's that little prong under the front sight. Here they ever so slightly shaved it down. As for the threaded barrel, like I said, this has a break, but since it could potentially take a flash hider, you have to do something about that. Now some would go to the extent of either not threading it or shaving the threads down. What they did here, since this is an original barrel, they simply tack welded a muzzle nut on. So it was actually okay to have threads under it as long as they weren't exposed, accessible, usable. So during the ban, if someone wanted a break like this, sometimes they would thread a barrel and tack weld, pin it on. So very light changes. Now, of course, if this kit had been a underfolding or side folding stock, that would not have been allowed. Some would continue to have those stocks, but they would pin them open or spot weld them open. That was that was a way. So you can see the, the changes that were forced upon, and frankly, that weren't. 
One gun I wanted to bring out because it became popular, especially during the assault weapons ban, is my M14 Semi-Auto M1As from Springfield. This is not a Springfield, but same same difference. While 10 round magazines were required for manufacture and sale post September 13, 1994, so-called pre-ban magazines of higher capacity were still allowed. Frankly, prohibiting them would have been a fool's errand because even then there were millions in the nation and a magazine is not serialized, not tracked, no way to know how many were even out there, much less try to collect them. So, some manufacturers would just ship their guns with a certified pre-band mag. Or sometimes you would get a used pre-band mag that may or may not work and a new 10-run mag that was guaranteed to work. That's actually how Century played the game. And I brought this out because no pistol grip. That meant they could have a different feature. Their one feature that typically these M1As, M14s selected was to retain the original flash hider. Meaning that back in the day, the only thing they had to remove and really change was chopping off the bayonet lug. Although, theoretically, as I was saying, theoretically you could have a muzzle brake and retain the lug. Although typically brakes of that era, because a lot of the original ones were 22 millimeters, same as uh, a grenade launcher, would be larger. 23, 24, so a, a grenade could never fit. Just how it, uh, how it played about. Mm-hmm. I brought out the LE 6320 to talk about another exclusion. Now this is otherwise a standard Title I firearm. It is semi-automatic, but another exemption was for government military use. Features were still allowed. So these had four position collapsing stocks. They had, frankly, not really very useful bayonet lugs because 16 inch barrel. They were still threaded half by 28 with a standard flash hider. So it kind of made an interesting in between category of gun, complete with the today kind of collectible, restricted markings. And the same would go for magazines produced during this era. They too would get government restricted markings. I didn't have time to dig one out, but it gives you the idea of what we're dealing with here and that they were still making guns with features and it's a little questionable how serious some people took these. But that's the rifles. Again, the ones that received the most focus. But there were other aspects and other categories. Our next category, and one not as often talked about, handguns. And actually, these three I did buy during the assault weapons ban. This one I did not, <laughs> but it's here for a very good reason. As before, these only apply to firearms that are semi-automatic, so revolvers, you're safe, and that take detaching magazines. And as before, we have a cutoff of September 13, 1994, for pre man versus post band mags. And this was actually more critical for handguns than it was for rifles of the day. Most of your rifles that otherwise met the criteria, you could find so called pre band mags for. Maybe at a bit of a premium, but you could find them. A lot of handguns, like this Walther P99, weren't even imported or even made before 94, so magazines did not exist. Others, like this Beretta M9 and this Glock, you could find pre-94 mags for. 
And as before, we had a list of five criteria, and two or more would make it an assault weapon handgun. Number one is interesting. A weapon that takes a magazine outside of the pistol grip. That's why I brought out the BZ-61 Scorpion. I grabbed the Makarov one because it was closer to hand. Magazine out there. Number two. Basically, no threaded barrels. They did expand upon it a bit to say a threaded barrel that could take a flash hider or a foregrip. I assume they meant handguard or a suppressor slash silencer. Essentially, no threaded barrels. Not a surprise there. Number three, weight limit. A handgun cannot weigh more than 50 ounces. So, three pounds or less, effectively. Um, not really applicable to a handgun, especially a polymer frame. And the Scorpion would still squeak in, but it does kind of put a kibosh on, say, AR-15 pistols. Number four is the one that is a meme. Barrel shroud was not allowed. Essentially something that could be installed that would prevent burns to the shooter. And of course this has become a bit of a meme because of it being very ill-defined and the people writing it didn't really have an idea. Regardless, it's there. Number five is interesting. No semi-automatic version of a military select fire handgun. What does that mean? It's very vague. We had AR-15 pistols and even some AK pistols during the ban, although it was hard to make them and get under that 50 ounce limit. But yeah, where that cutoff was was very ill-defined. Like I said, magazines were a little more important here. For example, there would have been no pre-ban mags of these. So you would have been, even if these came in during the ban, you would have, well, this would have been legal because you're outside of the pistol grip, would have been okay, but then a 10 round mag, no threaded barrel. When I first bought this P99, it came with 10 round limited mags, but when it was over, I bought 16 rounders and the grip is the same capacity, the same type. They didn't require change. So actually this one has no features to speak of under that. My Beretta here actually came with the 15 round mag because it was a certified pre-ban mag, even though the gun wasn't made until later. But I did actually find a 10 round Beretta 92 mag in the parts bin. And this kind of shows you one of the ways they made these 10 rounds. So same basic dimensions, top, bottom. They just dimpled them. Or in the case of the Walther, they just cut it off here and put in kind of a spacer. There are different ways to make it. But there you go. And when I bought this Glock, it came with a 10 round mag as well. Now what they did here, it, it looked like a double stack, but it was actually a single stack mag. They actually blocked off the column. So it was just a single stack, 10 round feed. It also did not work as well as a standard factory mag. But if you could find pre-ban Glock mags, which were pretty available, especially from police departments, you could grab those because a lot of those police departments would order brand new mags for themselves because of course they were still making LE marked mags and they would sell off their old mags. And if I'm being totally honest with you, even if a mag was marked LE restricted, not many people paid attention. But then again, it was not allowed. But the magazines were a bigger issue unless you had a gun like the Beretta or the Glock that took a standard mag. So why these rules? It seems a little weird with the magazine out of the pistol grip and the whole focus on extensions and shrouds. That's because the handgun they were really thinking of was the Tech 9. 
essentially all of these rules were written to prohibit the Tech 9 and all of its features and attributes. Of course, the manufacturer simply responded with the AB10, making the Tech 9 to fit within the guidelines. But that's neither here nor there. With that, we do have one more category. Shotguns were treated differently and had their own classification. Also keep in mind 1993 when the bill was being drafted and 1994 when it was passed, it was a different time. Nevertheless, we had rules and regs. Semi-automatic, no more than one feature, so two, two or more, it was an assault weapon shotgun. This time though, it's not specified to have to have a detaching magazine. Number one, no folding or collapsing stocks. So that puts the M4 and the uh, Vepra 12 out right here. You could, I guess you could have them. However, next, we could not have a uh, magazine capacity of over five rounds if it was tube fed. So since this is seven plus one, that would not be allowed. So no tube over that or this. Third, no pistol grip. So if you wanted a grip, you could not have the stock or a tube over five rounds. Interestingly, number four, a detaching magazine of any type. I didn't see any, you know, capacity. So theoretically, even a two-round detaching mag would be counted as a feature. So if you had a detaching mag shotgun, you could not have a pistol grip or a folding collapsing stock. Interestingly, bayonet lugs and threaded barrels, flash suppressors, they were not directly mentioned, possibly because they weren't really thinking about them at the time. Now, the Vepr 12 was not imported until long after the assault weapons ban was over. However, the Sega 12 did come in, but it came in in the, in the sporter form. Conversions were made, but limitations existed. Interestingly, back in 2012, pistol grips specifically were declared as a sporting feature, a legitimate sporting feature. It would be interesting to see if they would still be prohibited under any new legislation or if that exemption would, would be continued on. Now, we did also see the Benelli M4 1014 edition appear around eh, 2003, so towards the end of the ban, and uh, we can still actually get them. And they look very similar to this, but the stock is fixed in the open position. It actually is the same stock, but the tube isn't cut. They do use the pistol grip as a feature, but they have a magazine tube limited to five rounds. Interestingly, it seems to be five plus one. They don't seem to count the chambered one. Now some I've noticed think that 10 rounds, which this magazine is, is the limit. No, for shotguns specifically, 5 was the magic number for import and other things. I just wanted to show that because it did apply to shotguns. But only some autos. Pump actions, slide actions, were not under this purview. So they could do pretty much what they wanted. I remember buying one of the HK imported fab arm pumps that came with a folding stock. Now here my Supernova has the modern adjustable stock. Pike, eh, set you down for a sec. See? And it can have the 7 plus 1 tube. And I remember when the Mossberg 590 and 590A1 showed up, 
and they had gasp a bayonet lug and also an 8 plus 1 tube. It was even okay to put a barrel shroud on the thing that goes up. They just did not consider manually operated guns, be they bolt actions or shotguns or even revolvers to be assault weapons. It was the exclusive purview of semi-automatics. And those are our three categories. Again, both of these would have been legal during the 94-2004 assault weapons ban. Pump actions with a capacity of 8 to 9 shells of 12 gauge magnum. As I said at the beginning, I want this video to be factual and just to present evidence. My personal opinions and yours are perfectly valid, but not for here and right now. I'm kind of exercising the same restraint as I did when I was a teacher. And the assault weapons ban had a few noteworthy effects and lasting impacts on America and the firearms market. Trying to be fair, there several studies have been done over the years. One of the earliest was in 1999. The Department of Justice kind of did a preliminary look-in after five years, and their results were inconclusive. It should be pointed out that in 1998, two things did happen. That April, the uh, executive branch extended the 89 import ban, putting 56 more guns on the not allowed list, as well as prohibiting guns to come in that could accept high capacity magazines. Also, it should be noted and remembered that Columbine happened that year in the heart of the assault weapons ban. It's sunset, September 13, 2004. There were efforts to extend it, they failed. From that point, different organizations would conduct all kinds of studies. And again, most of them were inconclusive. Not all, but most. One of the most interesting, the FBI had a decades-long study of crimes and crime scenes. From 2007 to 2017, they compiled data. And they said that going by the definition of an assault weapon under the 94 Act, only 0.24% of crimes were committed with such a weapon. And in 2014, the Oxford University Press put out a book, and its ultimate conclusion was that the assault weapons ban did not save any lives. On the other hand, there were some studies that showed some more results, more on the police end of things. A 2016 study from the Violence Policy Center showed that fully one-fourth of police officers killed in the line of duty were killed with what, what, what could be defined a assault weapon, be it a handgun, shotgun, rifle, typically high capacity, and typically in urban areas. And this was backed up in a 2018 study where they looked at 10 cities, weapons recovered from crimes or crime scenes, roughly 25 to 30 percent were either quote-unquote assault weapons or were at least fitted with so-called high capacity, in other words, over 10 round magazines. And there's a bit of an explanation of this, and that's why I have these kind of laid out here, because another effect of the assault weapons ban and the war on terror was to popularize such guns. We might refer to these as MSRs, modern sporting rifles, or for being a little more cynical, EBRs, evil black rifles, but after the sunset of the assault weapons ban, people started buying 
in droves, AKs, ARs, and others. Part of it was simply after you tell people they cannot have something for 10 years, they want it. That's human psychology. It's also why the McRib has become popular at McDonald's. Another part was the war on terror and returning soldiers. Soldiers who served with an M4 or experienced an AK-47 overseas often want something like that at home for their own reasons. And a younger generation simply accepted these, whereas the previous generation, not so much. The guns we looked at at the beginning of the video were kind of what were common and around before 1994. Changing times and changing shooting competitions, three gun and whatnot. One of the first to come out was the Wasser, that's why I brought it out. Century was very quick on the ball to introduce them again with uh, threaded barrels, bayonet lugs, of course, pistol grips, and soon they would first have side folding stocks because they were quick and easy to install, but then underfolding stocks appeared. And funnily enough, before this, underfolders were pretty unpopular because they're not the most comfortable things. ARs would quickly get collapsing adjusting stocks again. Something I will point out, since I'm not very tall, and a lot of my friends are taller, is not just an evil feature, but it's actually nice to be able to adjust the length of pull. And of course, guns were modern. In 1994, we didn't have optics on a lot of things, and we didn't have Picatinny rails, not to mention M-lock on a lot of things. The era of accessorization was upon us. And it extended to shotguns, including pumps. I brought out the Mossberg 590 Shockwave because this idea of a short barrel under 18 inches was not really thought of before. Technically legal and ATF approved. They, did, they get away with this because it's 26 inches and does not have a buttstock or pistol grip. Probably something that the gun industry would not have thought about prior to 94. And the import industry continued to expand and you see things like the Suzy Pro. And things like stabilizing arm braces which originally were made and approved for use by disabled veterans and you know other disabled people like myself. Something I greatly appreciate, and probably anyone at the range with me greatly appreciates me being able to have better control over firearms. In fact, the import industry really has had a renaissance in the last uh, several years, and a lot of interesting things have come in. Yes, more things have been available, but they wouldn't be here without demand. Now, why that demand happens that's a matter of debate. But there are millions of such guns in this country, as well as new production magazines, 20, 30, even more capacities around. And that's where we're at today. Yes, classic guns still sell, but less and less. Cowboy action has actually fallen off popularity. And many people do compete with various guns like these. And I know more than a few farmers around here that pack an AK in their tractor in case a snake is around or they have to put down a wounded animal for its own mercy. But that's kind of getting off topic. I, w I just wanted to talk about where we're at today and you know potentially why we are there. And since many more of these are a common thing it does kind of explain why they are appearing more in activities. The question is, are they obtained legally and legally possessed or not? It's not only a renewed assault weapons ban that's been proposed in light of recent events. People have also talked about universal background checks, gun buybacks, gun confiscations, gun registries, mental health and health care in general, so on and so forth. But I wanted to talk about the assault weapons ban 
because it seems to be misunderstood and there also seems to be an attitude of we did it before and we can do it again on the first point I hope this video has clarified what it is because I remember when at sunset in September 2004 there were local news crews going around to gun shops asking about the fact that select fire NFA fully automatic guns being legal again they thought that assault weapons ban meant no full autos when in reality we just talked about the differences essentially the difference between a ban era gun and a non ban era gun you could have a folding or collapsing stock again you could have a flash suppressor or threaded barrel in general you could have a bayonet lug and you could get new production magazines that could hold more than 10 cartridges is that a difference that would matter to date most studies show inconclusive and I would also caution you correlation does not automatically equal causation there does not seem to be overwhelming evidence that the 94 2004 assault weapons ban was effective and did save lives now one could argue it's because it was not in place long enough and that it had many so-called loopholes and that it allowed many things to be grandfathered in alternatively one could argue that the guns we looked at at the beginning of the video even the ones that looked rather sporting are just as lethal a bullet is a bullet and the shape of the gun it comes out of is really not that impactful certainly having a bayonet lug and flash suppressor don't, do, do not matter a pistol grip may matter a little bit to the handling and an adjustable stock really only makes it comfortable to set the length of pull a folding stock well it can be made more compact but that's really about it now 10 round magazines there may be more of an argument there on the other hand people get quick at changing magazines and plenty of AR and AK mags are out there legal or illegal anyway that's getting out of the scope of this I'm just trying to bring up thinking points and of course the argument can always be made that criminals especially those willing to commit murder aren't exactly too worried about complying with rules and restrictions on the configuration of firearms we should also point out that a lot of the guns used in crimes are not legally purchased or even if they were they're not in the hands of those who purchased them that would be an interesting study in and of itself but again getting out of the scope of this video if nothing else whether the viewer is pro 2a or pro gun control I hope this does at least give you a good idea of what the assault weapons ban was and was not I will also point out that while the federal assault weapons ban ended in 2004 many states continued it California and New York foremost among them in fact they have stricter rules and regulations now than they did back in the 90s make of that as you will I will probably do a black box on my personal channel talking more about background checks and buybacks and other regulations and restrictions and talk more on my personal thoughts opinions and suggestions but this is a professional channel and I want to keep it professional as best I can so I hope this was respectful that was my intention and factual so essentially I tried to do this much as I would teach a class 
If you have any questions about the logistics, please let me know and I'll do my best to answer them. After I did live through the assault weapons ban firsthand, I can tell you things. And do feel free to comment, but I would ask you, please, please, please be respectful and just cognizant of the situation right now. On both sides, emotions are high and neither side is evil. I want to say that. Both sides are simply viewing this issue from alternative perspectives and directions. So while I always welcome people to give their viewpoint and thoughts and opinions, all I ever ask is you do it in a respectful, constructive way. That's it, folks. With that, I do appreciate you tuning in. And hopefully the next video will have a more optimistic tone. But I just felt this was worth talking about now. Trying to educate some on what's going on and what hasn't gone on. If you could, please do like, share, and subscribe. And not to put a point on it, but the link to the Patreon is in the description if you'd like to kind of learn more about me and the channel. This is Misha. Wishing everyone the best. And I will catch you next time.